how many of you have seen this book called science and the common understanding how many of you know the name oppenheimer okay good <laughs> oppenheimer is actually one of the great physicists of the last century he passed away sometime just before the turn of the millennium and um, he was um, he was a genius in many ways although he didn't get the nobel prize but anyway he wrote a book called science and the common understanding he described what he called the house of science the same description is applicable to the house of education as i call it let me explain let me also go back and tell you what lewis a uh, great chemist said he said you go to these ancient monuments let's say you go to this kapaleshwara temple or something since you are overwhelmed by its beauty and completeness so you sort of talk in hushed tones then he says think of the time when it was actually being built you would have seen the scaffolding you would have seen the workers working the noise of hammers sp- people would be spitting talking and so on then he said you realize that these monuments are the result of ordinary human effort given a direction and purpose so eventually most of human activity blossoms if you give a direction and purpose to it the house of education is somewhat like the ancient monument but there are also many differences but let me first explain why it's like a ancient monument the house this is a metaphor don't take it literally but the house of education is simply a construct that describes all activities by which knowledge is passed on from one generation to the next among human beings you might say why is it important that's why we are on the top of the food chain you know all other animals do only copying so they know cleverer than their parents but whereas uh, in education as knowledge is passed on from generation to generation each generation gets cleverer so you kids are actually cleverer than all of us I mean, intrinsically but you have a long way to go but uh, let me explain this house of education this house of education is a vast house it's the beauty of it is it's got all doors open all windows open and everywhere there are signs of welcome you might object sir every time we have to get admission we have to struggle so much into a school or you go into college you have those are unfortunate things that happen in an in, in a country where you don't have enough seats for the number of students applying so we'll ignore that for the moment basically the house of education is an open house everybody is welcome the difference it's also not really built to a plan because nobody knows where new fields will come in there are lots of researchers and so on but when you enter a school for example you have a teacher who guides you through all the completed rooms these are rooms that are completely done it's beautiful everything is beautifully arranged everything is in place so that's what we take you through and then after we take you through 12 rooms we say you have now graduated i mean of course you have to write a silly examination that can't be helped but once you're familiar with the design and the beauty of figuratively speaking 12 rooms you get a certificate saying you've finished your school education then you go on to undergraduate in undergraduate again you see many more finished rooms but some of these rooms are not fully finished occasionally furniture is rearranged in some place or a picture is you know they think this picture is not the right picture they change the picture and so on change the decoration then you go through post graduate education there the rooms are even less finished in fact i ki say make a tongue in cheek statement that when i understand something very well i teach undergraduates when i don't understand it so well i teach post graduates when i don't understand it at all i teach my phd students because at the phd level you are sharing your ignorance with the student and you hope together you can solve some problems that you couldn't solve by yourself earlier around this time some of you may come back to be guides to take other novices through this house of education so basically it's a cooperative phenomenon where the teacher and the student work together in order to add to knowledge and to understand what has happened already before there's some principles of teaching that I'll share with you this is also partly you'll have a chance to go and tell your teachers no no this is what uh, professor anand said was the principle of teaching why are you teaching this way and so on but is also meant for my own colleagues teachers these principles are actually lot of them have been enunciated very nicely by arabindo 
How many of you know the name Aurobindo? Oh, good. Many more names. How many of you have read a book, book, small book by Aurobindo on education? Anyway, let me tell you some principles that he says. Aurobindo, of course, uses English words that are very uncommon. That are, so you have to keep a dictionary by your side if you read Aurobindo. But you will discover that the words he uses are absolutely right. I mean, they are the, the ones to use. But I will try to tell you in simpler English. First principle of Aurobindo is nothing can be taught. That means all of us lose our jobs. But the fact is that the teacher is a facilitator of learning. You know, when you teach, the message doesn't always reach the student. And uh, many students aren't listening also at all times. But in any case, the idea is that you can only facilitate learning of the student by sharing with them what you enjoyed. The second principle of uh, teaching is, this is very difficult to follow in India. You should go from the near to the far. What Aurobindo says is that when you teach something, you must give examples from the immediate environment of the student. Then the student will grasp things very well. I will tell you not to be more concrete. For example, we teach air pollution. But the only data I have is for Los Angeles. So I sit here in Madras and I can't give example of Madras and tell you how pollution can be prevented here or what happened in the past to pollute the place. I have to tell you about Los Angeles. And it's meaningless to tell you about Los Angeles. Anyway, I was telling you about the second principle. I don't have data about the immediate environment. So I keep telling our students, when you go out to the industry, give me back information that I can use as an example. Unfortunately, in India, we don't do this very well because we have an oral tradition. We have always communicated orally from one generation to the other. We are not very good at documentation. We are beginning to change. The third principle is, this is an important principle. It says, um, diverse approaches to the same problem will improve your understanding much more than doing many problems. This is the opposite advice you will get when you do entrance examinations. Unfortunately, entrance examinations are not education. Let me, I'll explain that separately. But the problem, of, the beauty of education is it's enjoyable and all that, but it becomes a harassment when you think of the exam that's going to come. I mean, the teacher is talking, you're not worried about what the teacher is saying and how interesting it is. He says, how will she ask a question on this for me? You know, what a question will come in the examination? How will I answer it? How will I get marks? This becomes the obsession. But uh, let me come back to what Aurobindo says. And I'll illustrate this by a small story. There was a mathematician and a physicist. They were both given a glass of water and asked to make tea. So they boiled the water, they added tea leaves and made tea. Then they were both called, given in two empty glasses each and asked to make tea. The physicist again boiled, filled it with water, then boiled the water and made tea. The mathematician filled it with water, left it on the table. He said, by the previous theorem, I've already made tea. <laughs> that is the method you should use. If you can reduce a problem that you meet to a problem that you have solved before, then you have not only seen the connection, you are also doing an intelligent, you are solving the new problem intelligently. So whenever a problem is posed to you, you should ask, is it different conceptually from what I have already done? If it is not different, do not do it. Now, this is bad advice for an entrance exam or for your final exam. So we will put exams apart. I will tell you how to handle exams as a five minute, two minute advice at the end. But fundamentally, you should be able to solve a problem from different ways, from different angles. Then your understanding of the problem will improve. See, the purpose of education is to find what is called unity in knowledge. That is the whole purpose of science and in general of all of university education is to tell you there is so much diversity around you, there are so many different things. But a few principles can explain all of them. The question is, can we discover those principles? How do you discover those principles? Newton, for example, did the greatest unification, which is why he is considered one of the greatest scientists of all time. Because he showed that planet's movement and a, a stone falling down or a fruit falling from a tree are all the same. The same laws govern everything. So if you put in the correct mass, correct bodies involved, then you can get to show that the phenomena are identical. So the, this search for unity is what you are doing. And in this search for unity, you have to be able to understand from different points of view the same phenomena. That's why diversity is important. Di solving diverse problems, I mean, solving 
a, a problem by diverse means is better than solving many problems. Then another principle of education is that uh, repetition is an important part of education. So if you are all complaining about teachers repeating themselves, it is for a very good reason. Let me tell you a story. When I first went to the US, I had a professor who dragged me off to listen to a pastor. This pastor was a very good speaker. He spoke very well. So I went there and this man spoke and in those days I was also a young kid and I was quite a good listener. This man repeated himself seven times. So at the end of it, I asked him, why did you repeat yourself seven times? He said, gee, did I do that? Then I did right because in the school of pastors, they tell me only one seventh of the congregation is listening at any time. This is true in class too. In class actually we assume that as kids you listen a little better. We assume one third of the class is listening at any time. So we normally tell you what we are going to tell you, then we tell you, then we tell you what we told you. <laughs> it is called the American farmer method but that is what all teachers use because when you start off these kids have forgotten the last class. So you have to tell them no, no, you know last class we discussed and then we tell you this. Then in this class we are going to discuss and then we start discussing. <laughs> so this repetition is also an important part of uh, Then let me tell you a little bit about learning because teaching and learning are not synonymous. I may teach and go away, you may learn nothing. I mean sometimes you do not relate to your teacher, sometimes you relate to your teacher very well. But I want to tell you this because it is an important aspect of education and it is very often overlooked. Our idea of learning has comes learning and creativity, our ideas, modern ideas come from the so called split brain experiments of a person called Sperry, Sperry and co-workers. Sperry was a neurosurgeon, he got a Nobel Prize and he and his co-workers used to work on accident victims. These people had head injuries and they either had damaged left brain or right brain. So the summary of what they said, this is a little bit of an oversimplification but this is given in a book by Blakeslee on the right brain. The summary is like this, there are four steps to learning and creativity. This is common for all. Uh, this division into parts is simply for our understanding. I mean it is not as if your brain thinks like this but basically they said your brain, the human brain has two parts, the left brain and the right brain. The left brain is logical, good with words and good with step by step reasoning. The right brain on the other hand is intuitive, it thinks in terms of pictures and it is actually illiterate. If you had a damage to your left brain, you would not be able to, your language skills will go away. You would not be able to speak, you would not be able to, I mean you would not be able to do cogently step by step talking. But what happens in actual life is that there is a redundancy, there is a provision in nature that if your left brain is damaged, over a period of 6 months, the right brain will learn to do the job of the left brain. So it is not, there is a time delay but you do not lose everything. But uh, because of the split brain experiments, these people could isolate what happens in each brain and this is the summary. So the first step is data gathering, it is called data gathering because you are watching, you are hearing things, you are getting various sense perceptions and you are learning a lot of things. In fact, I keep telling my colleagues, if students do not, this is not a license for students to not to listen in class but in practice I tell my colleagues relax if the students do not seem to be listening to you do not worry their left brain is listening anyway. This is true you may not actually appear to listen but your left brain is collecting that information which is why you know when you read for the exam all of you must have this experience you actually went listening in class but when you read you suddenly say oh this is why the teacher went on and on about this you know <laughs> you are not listening but you still know that the teacher went on and on about it. That is because the teacher was trying to emphasize a point but you were not listening but your left brain was collecting this information. Having have once the left brain has collected this information, your right brain begins to wonder how do I put all these together. You know you have so many subjects, so many things that you know and you see so many things on the way and you want to know how can I make sense of all this. The right brain always tries to make sense but it does not always succeed. What it builds is models to understand the world. But suddenly you think, ah, here is a model that explains everything I have seen. That is called the enlightenment stage. The in-between stage when you struggle for models is called the incubation stage. 
That is, you are incubating these ideas in your right brain and asking what is the model, what is the model. You know, you may not do this explicitly, but you are actually doing it without your knowing it on the right, in the right brain. The problem with these model that you, models that you come up with and the model that seems to work is that most of these models are wrong because they are quick generalizations by your right brain saying this is the model. That is why we do not all get Nobel Prizes, you know, one in a million, one in <laughs> ten million gets a Nobel Prize because their right brain ideas are good. It is the right brain that comes up with this unification. That is why you need a fourth step which is called experimental verification. In nowadays, if you formulate a scientific theory along with it, you must propose an experiment that may actually lead to downfall of the theory. For example, when Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity, he suggested that a measurement should be made during a solar eclipse in a place he also located the place in Africa where the solar eclipse was going to occur two years later, where it could be seen to see if light from the sun is actually bent by the stars. And this bending is very small, but they had to do a elaborate experiment. And if that experiment had failed, Einstein's theory would have been thrown out. But along with the theory, he proposed it. And then of course, Eddington, the famous Eddington experiment, he showed that the bending of light occurs exactly as Einstein suggested it should. And so, the general theory of relativity was accepted. But this idea of experimental verification is very recent in the sense it is the last 400 years that we are doing this. Before that, we had a Greek, there were only two traditions in learning basically. One was called Greek, the other was called the Hindu tradition. Both of them had similar ideas. In fact, if you read Greek mythology also, it sounds like exactly like our Indian mythology. I mean, lot of their gods have the same characteristics as our Indian gods in the sense that in both really you do not have people who are all wrong, all evil and all good. They all have a mix of mixture of qualities. Anyway, coming back to this, in both traditions of Hindu and Greek traditions, we used our left brain to collect data, but we did not use our right brain. We went to a sage, somebody who was very wise and told him, look, I have observed all these things, I am very confused, you please explain. Then say, say Vasishta or Vishwamitra or Aristotle there or somebody like that would explain to you or oh, do not be confused, I will explain to you. The trouble is with a sage explaining it is you cannot verify it because it is blasphemy. The man is a sage, so you cannot question what he said. In fact, the first person who actually defied all this was Galileo. And I will tell you another actual story. Aristotle had two wives and he made a statement in 260 AD that women have less teeth than men. I mean, he had to explain why men were superior in some way to women. And he suggested that men have more teeth than women. And it was 1400 AD before somebody had the guts to count the teeth of all the women, many women and many men and say, no, no, they all have the same number of teeth. Some others had seen it before, but Aristotle said it. How can you def contradict it? So, nobody had the guts. It was Galileo who said, no matter who says what, question it. Always question things till you understand it, till you experimentally verify it. And the funny thing is, Aristotle himself had two wives. He never counted their teeth. <laughs> so, this business of having a sage to explain the world to you is a bit risky. It is a good thing, but at the same time it is risky. So, you should not always take the sage fully at face value. But in any case, I will also give you another uh, example of right brain and left brain combination in two different people. Our Ramanujan was a great number theorist, you all know that. And he was invited by Hardy to come to Cambridge to work on number theory because Ramanujan wrote to Hardy and Hardy found some of the results that Ramanujan wrote were so wonderful and they were not, they did not exist in mathematics and he said, how can a kid living in Chennai with practically no background in good mathematics education, how can he come up with these results? So, let us invite him here and take a chance. So, I invited him. And apparently, as soon as he went there, Hardy posed a very difficult problem to Ramanujan, something that had not been solved for 25 years in combinatorial mathematics. In combinatorials is about how many ways you can do certain complicated things. Anyway, this Ramanujan just listened to the question, then went to the board and wrote the answer. It was a very complicated formula. And Hardy stared at it and said, this is ridiculous. I mean, this problem has not been solved for 25 years. Here is a guy who comes in and writes a solution on the board. 
and he stared at the solution. He said it was too beautiful to be not true. There, the appreciation of beauty is important. At the same time, there's no way Hardy could tell why that was right. And then he worked on it for one and a half years, logically proved it was the right result. And then went to Ramanujam and said, how can you do such a ridiculous thing? How can you write a solution to a problem? He said, I didn't solve the problem. Goddess of Namakal solved it and gave it to me. <laughs> this, is, this is an important cultural trait. In India, we think faith in God, doesn't matter what God you have, you can have your own personal God. Faith in God and humility are important prerequisites to intuitive understanding. I think they are important characteristics. You shouldn't ignore them. But let me also say that university education always teaches you logic. I can't teach you intuition because I don't know how my own my mind works. I mean, in fact, I'll tell you another story. <laughs> Sorry, another two minutes. I'll take another two minutes. This was in 1990, I think. I was in the US, 93. 93 and 92, I was watching television and you know in 1990 there was an expo that is an industrial exhibition in Canada and they housed it in a huge dome that was made of wood. It was a very big construction. It was done temporarily in order to exhibit it and the dome itself was an exhibit. It was done by a carpenter who had passed some eight standard or something. This fellow was being interviewed on TV. I just turned it on and I listened to the interview. And this girl asked him all kinds of questions. She said, how did you support this member? How did you design this part? How did you do this? After about five or six questions, the guy couldn't answer. I mean, he had built it. Then he looked at her, he became red in the face and he said, you don't expect me to understand everything I know. <laughs> it's a beautiful statement. There are some things that you know by gut feeling, but you can't explain, you can't understand. So I think this is an important part that you have to realize. There are some things that you know. I mean, if Tendulkar is playing cricket and hits a beautiful shot, he doesn't sit there and say, what did Newton say? What is the force? What? <laughs> How is the ball bowled? He doesn't calculate all this and try to hit the shot. I mean, he'd be bowled long before he finished any calculations. So you're doing it by your right brain, using your right brain. And you shouldn't lose that ability. Unfortunately, all education here and in the West emphasizes left brain activity. Because only if it's some logical, I can come to class and explain to you how it's done. If it's not logical and I say, oh, you know, you just do it. And uh, I'm not teaching you anything. And after two minutes, you'll walk away. He's not telling us anything useful. You will also stop listening. So there's no way we can communicate intuition. But you can nurture it yourself. And one way of doing it, I've recommended it. Batch after batch of students, they don't uh, take up the recommendation. But I'll try it again with a new batch. My recommendation is, however complicated the problem, you will find that intuitively you know the answer or you can sort of guess the answer. Always guess the answer and write down your guess. Then work the problem out logically and see if your logic confirms your intuition. That is, see if the answer that you get by logical deduction is the same as what you got by intuition. If it's not, if they don't agree, then you have to think again. Either you have to check your logic or again ask where your intuition went wrong. Because your intuition can go wrong because of various prejudices that come into life as you grow up. And it's something you can't help. I'm not asking you to fight that. Because you have various experiences, you go through various things. Each of you will have a different twist to your intuition. And those twists can be sometimes very wrong. So what you have to do is keep checking. Then you can either correct your intuition or your logic. I tried this in IIT. I told our students in thermodynamics, I teach thermodynamics, I said, guess the answer, write it down and then do the problem logically. If logic confirms your intuition, then you get self-confidence. You get more and more confident about your own right brain activity. And eventually, self-confidence is far too important in life for you to ignore. But you know what our students do? I mean, this is probably what you will also do. They write their answer, right brain answer in pencil. Then they work out the problem in pen. If this answer doesn't agree, they copy this answer there. <laughs> I tell them there are no extra marks. I'm not with checking. You are checking for yourself. But they say, anyway, in case you think of giving marks, it's better for these two to be the same. <laughs> so there's such an obsession with marks. Now, I'll just close by giving you some advice about examinations and so on. And I hope your teachers agree with me. You can't ignore exams. This is a mass education system. So my recommendation is, and I'll tell you another one story before I say this. Rajagopal Charit. I don't know how many of you know the name. 
Rajaji is wonderful man. He came to our college when I was, I am that old. In 1963, he came to our college when I was in college. And he addressed us all and he said, nowadays examinations have become more important than teaching. And uh, he looked at us and said, I believe you have exams every year. In those days, we had exam, only one exam at the end of the year. It was beautiful because eight months, you could goof and you could also study only things you liked. Those you will remember for life. In education, we give you many courses. Those are all required for completeness because some of it will be required later and also we don't know where you're going. In some, we don't know where you're going to work. So one subject is important for some students, another subject will be important for another student. Since we don't know, the university always spreads its education over many topics. And all of you won't like all topics. I mean, some topics, some of you will find interesting, some of you will find boring. But it's a matter of discipline that you learn all the subjects. But what we used to do is eight months, we did whatever we liked, whatever subjects we liked. Then one month, we mugged like mad for the exam. <laughs> I mean, that's what you all do too. But unfortunately, if you have frequent examinations, and we are also guilty of it, this is borrowed from the West, this business of frequent, uh, it's called continuous evaluation, and I hate the word. Because there's no point in evaluating. First of all, let me also tell you, and this I think my your teachers will also agree with me, if you hate exams, we hate them more. Because you people write one exam and you go away. I have to grade 100 papers. When I finish grading 100 papers, I discover I haven't taught you anything because most of you will write wrong things. And <laughs> then I get very depressed for two days. <laughs> I tried very hard. I taught them this, I taught them that, but they haven't learned anything. Maybe I didn't teach it right. Then you go back again. And you have to do this year after year. And then you discover after 30 years, nothing will change. They will always do badly. But we have to do our duty. <laughs> so we also hate exams. But in mass examination system, in a mass education system, there's no choice. I have to give you some ranks. I have to say, I'm not interested in finding out how clever you are. You know, I don't have enough brains to cope with the world. I am struggling. Why would I want to find out how clever you are and also mark you? You know, clever one, clever two, clever three. <laughs> what a bore. You know, but we are forced to do this. So basically, you can't ignore exams. But what I recommend is you set off a fraction of the time, two thirds of the time in school, you do exactly what you're very interested in. Then that last one third, you mug like mad for the exam and write your exam. Then after the exam, immediately you get another two months of liberation. Study only what interests you, study it well, and pursue it further. That way, you will find your interest also. So I'm sorry that uh, we are forcing an examination system on you that we also dislike. Also, because of competition between schools, now marks are getting to be asymptotically 100. The other day, I recommended a very bright kid, 97%. And that principal laughed at me. 97 is no mark at all nowadays. 99 plus only we admit. So there is no limit to this. You go on getting more and more marks and getting less and less chance of admission in a good school. But these are realities. Don't let all these things bother you. Education is great fun. Examinations are a bore. But examinations are like a king to whom you have to pay this. You know, unless you pay, they'll trouble you. So also take care of the king, but take care of yourself first. So three months, absolutely find out what, is, what you find interesting and pursue it very well. And uh, this technology enhanced education that we give is mainly because we're not able to reach, we, there aren't enough teachers in, in India compared to the number of students we have. Therefore, we are using technology to transfer these things, I mean, to teach these things. But there's really no substitute for a teacher. And the only best way for you to use a teacher is to first see the teacher not as somebody who is out to fail you. I mean, the teacher has no interest in failing you. In fact, we all try to push you away because otherwise you will come back and write the exam. One more person. <laughs> so we are actually in, in a cooperative business and you make a life easier for us. If, in fact, I'll tell you one secret which I'm sure whenever I come start taking a class, I look for those four or five faces that will show a change, you know, before and after. They haven't understood it, then they understand it and suddenly their faces will become bright. In fact, the cosmetics use this advertisement. I often find the face before the cosmetic better than the face <laughs> after the cosmetic. But as far as students are concerned, there is absolutely no doubt that when they understand something and their face brightens up, they look so much better than when they didn't understand something. And unfortunately, most of you have been taught not to show the teacher this face. You know, you'll sit up like this without showing them any, but three or four kids can't help it they will break into this thing. So we look for those four or five faces. We'll be sitting here, there, and so on. 
and if they are absent, we get very depressed. <laughs> so, we are all also looking for, you know, somebody to appreciate. I mean, we are not teaching you what we learned, we discovered on our own. We are only passing on knowledge from one generation to another. And you have to appreciate the fact that even Newton said that. He said, uh, the reason I saw more is because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And that's a fact. All the time, your the accumulated knowledge is already available to you. And then in schools and in these colleges, what we do is try and say, <laughs> we can't go on adding to the portion. So when we add something, we remove something. We decide what's useful in the future and so on. So that's what we try to do. And I hope, uh, what have they come for, by the way? <laughs> you pulled me out suddenly and asked me to talk. Yeah. Uh, the Digital India Week is getting celebrated. Oh, for Digital India Week. That is. Yeah. Uh, let me just give you a word of warning alone about Digital India <laughs> or digital anything. The problem is that there is a continuity in education. And the interesting thing are the connections. You know, when you learn two facts, Carl Sagan said that. He said, the methods of science are more important than the results of science. The results may go wrong, but the methods are universal. So you must remember that while you get these bits of learning, the important thing is the connection between these bits. In fact, that is why I object to this uh, frequent exams and all that, because we have all kinds of rules. I teach ABC, give an exam, asking if you know ABC. Then I have DEF. And when I ask you about DEF, if I ask about A, you will say, sir, out of portion. <laughs> So I, the real point is that there is a continuity and there is a connection between these things. And the connection is what is important. That's what leads you to do interesting things later. So while I'm not against Digital India, because Digital India is the only way you can reach a large number of people. The fact is that you can't reach. In fact, now there is a new initiative to teach rural women to use Google. And then they get as clever as anybody else, because they also Google. I mean, this is what we do when we go to class now. We Google to find out what you Google to find out, so that you can't corner us with questions. I mean, we know what you got also from Google. But I think it's a good thing. We've democratized knowledge completely. But I think it's still important for you to remember that these connections are very important. And you must appreciate the aesthetic connections, the aesthetics of the connections. Then you learn to look at beauty in this. I hope you do, and I hope you have a wonderful time. I mean, you have a great opportunity. I know you also have more stress. But actually, I think the stresses are more on the parents than on the kids. I mean, they say stress. Mr. Kapil Sibel once told me, children are completely stressed out. I said, who told you that? I mean, he was very easy to talk to, although he was minister. He said, what do you mean? You think they're not stressed out? I said, they're not. I mean, they, they look very stressed in the exam. When they go out, after five minutes, they're all laughing, playing. They haven't been thinking about the exam. So they can handle it. But if you think about it, you think you're stressing them. That's because you're so much older. You can't handle the stress of the present generation. So the kids will take care of themselves. It's only when parents start worrying too much about the stress that all difficulties arise. Otherwise, the simple principle of teachers is to relax. Students also to relax. You learn best when you relax. But do remember, you have to pay some. You know, there is, uh, what's it called, toll booth. That's the examination. Don't try to run past the toll booth very fast. <laughs> Make your payment and go. But that you can do in about one-fourth of the time. So three-fourths of the time, you can have wonderful fun. I hope you do, and I hope you have wonderful time. Thank you very much. OK, so the government's aim is to see, I've written it down because I didn't know. OK, the government is saying we are going to encourage people their involvement and then create awareness about all the digital things that we have around us okay and even transform india into a digitally empowered society that means what they are trying to tell us is you know all of us should be aware of what is around us and how this can help us in our education just being a good member of the society right so today i am going to tell you about online education what it is all about and how it can help us. Since you are all 11th and 12th, pretty soon you are going to, going to some university, some college, right? And then those universities, you may take up a course in engineering or some humanities or topics. But then there, are, there might be some topics that they are not teaching at college, but you are still interested in. Okay, so these online courses, you can go and look it up. And they are very interesting and you will see how. Now, what is online education? When I say online education, what comes to your mind? What does that mean, online education? We all go and look it up in the YouTube, Google, right? As soon as we get an assignment from school, what do we do? 
I'll go and look it up in Google first, right? Wikipedia. We'll just take some information on Wikipedia, right? But then, there is more to it, online education. Okay. Many universities, including the IITs, we all, all these in universities in India, abroad, outside India, they are all offering courses. Now, what are online courses? It's just like your regular class at school, college. Okay. The professor or the teacher, they will come and talk. They will be doing it in front of a camera. So, it is getting recorded, right? And then it is posted or published on a site. Once it is published and if you want to take up that online course, you can go sign up. And then the videos are there, you can go and watch anytime. So, once you sign up for an online course, the videos, you can access the videos anytime, anywhere. All you will need is a computer and an internet. These days, how many of you have smartphones? A good majority, right? So, you can access these courses using your phone. And some of these are available as MP3s. You just have to listen while you are jogging or playing, right? Do you do that? Do you listen to music? Yeah, so you can do that also. So, online courses, they are exactly like a course conducted in a classroom, except that it happens online. Online meaning you have to log into a site, you have to access that course there, okay? Now, usually, see, in colleges, in schools, we have semesters, right? One semester, two semesters per year, maybe three semesters. Online courses typically, they go on for like a few weeks, sometimes eight weeks, sometimes 12 weeks. So, it does not go on for a year, you know, at least now. So, it is actually, you know, you go sign up in a matter of, you know, eight weeks, it is over. You just have to be committed for those eight weeks, okay? And then what happens is every week they will release a few videos, like say Monday to Friday, there will be one video per day. So, you can go and either download the videos or once you sign up, you can just go watch anytime. And then even, you know, if there are say five videos per week, on a Saturday, Sunday, you can just sit and watch. Each video is like what, 20, 25 minutes. You can easily commit like one or two hours for that and finish it. And there will be some assignments. Again, all these assessments, assignments, everything is submitted online. So, it is happening online. So, it is not like, you know, you are sitting in a classroom. You are sitting at home or in a library, wherever you have a computer, you sit there, you are watching, you are listening to the video and then once you are done, you can submit your assignment online. Okay? There is no pressure from anybody to uh, telling you, you have to submit on Monday, you have to submit on Tuesday. What happens is once, once assignments come on, there will be a deadline. Okay, today, the assignment is on. They will say within a week, next Wednesday, you have to submit it. Nobody is going to come and remind you, please submit, please submit, tomorrow is the da last date, you have to submit, nothing like that. Now even, you know, friends, did you submit? No, I didn't submit, did you submit? You do that, right? But then, you know, online, it's up to you. You have to motivate yourself and submit the online. Now, but the thing is, once, let's say you have a doubt, who do you ask? Now, what do you do? You can either approach your teacher in your classroom or you can ask your friends, right? I didn't understand this, what do we do, right? So, when you are taking an online course, what do you do when you have a question? There, most courses, there will be something called a discussion forum, okay? What you can do is you can go post your question or once you are once you have signed up for the course, the discussion forum is on and what you can do is you can go and see if the question is already there. Just like you, somebody else also had a similar question, similar doubt. They would have already posted there and the professor would have already answered to that question. So, it is very easy to go and answer, ask questions, get answers. Sometimes what will happen is, let us say I am a student, I am posing a question and then uh, uh, maybe that evening I go and check it again. One of my peers, meaning somebody who is also taking a course along with me, he must have already figured it out. So, he may post the answer saying, oh, I also had a similar doubt. So, I went and looked it up and this is the answer. So, the professor does not have to answer the question. It is already answered there. So, it is similar to you asking your friends calling up and asking, I did not understand this, what do I do? It is already there, okay? So, I encourage all of you to look it up at least, okay? And then when if you have the time, after 11th, after 12th, when you are waiting for your results or whatever, you can always look up for online courses and see if this is there any topic that interests me. If you are somebody who likes math, there are topics in economics that has a lot of math. You might be interested in taking something different, but it is also based on math, things like that. Now, why is how or how is online education helpful? We already have classes, colleges. Why are we even going for these online courses? See, they are conveniently accessed anytime, any place by anyone. That we already said. All we will need is a computer with internet connection. These days, like I said, even a mobile phone, smartphone, that will help. Now, this is especially useful 
for people who live in very far away places. We, have, we all see in, it on the news, you know, how people living in villages, people who may not be able to go to the hospital. These mobile hospitals come to the village and they do, a, you know, dental checkup or eyes, you know, checkup and all that. Something similar, if they have a computer with internet connection in that village and they particularly want to take uh, one topic, so, and they may not be able to go to the far away college. It might because they have a farm to take care of or whatever, right? But so that when the computer and internet is available, they can take up a course which they are interested in, right? So this really helps for people who live in really remote, far away places. And then sometimes they cannot pay the fees. They simply don't have the money to attend a particular class. Sometimes, you know, physically handicapped. They are not able to travel to a college to take up a class. And then sometimes, you know, people who work full time and they are not able to leave that job to take up a full time class. For people like that, they can, you know, use the uh, weekends or after work time to sign up for these courses and spend a few weeks and you will finish a course. That might help you get a better job. There are other advantages, you know. For example, there are co these are courses sometimes offered by universities outside India. I am living in Chennai, but I am looking up for an online course that is offered by, say, a university in the US. I cannot physically go there right now. One, I cannot afford it. Two, there are visa issues and all that, right? So then, but if the online course is there, all I need is a computer and internet at my home in Chennai. And I am taking a course that is offered by a university in the US. So it is very accessible now. You will need a computer, internet, and it's very easy for you to take up a course that a particular topic that you are interested in, but it's offered by another university far away from us. Now, also, most many topics, these are all offered best professors, the really best teaching staff. So you may you may be attending a school or a college, a local school, a local college, but you are interested in a topic that is taught by a professor, a really good professor somewhere. Again, online course is the answer. You can go and look it up, look up that course. Okay? Now, another thing is, let's say I am into uh, English literature or whatever, right? But I'm also interested in movies. I want to know how language plays a role in movies, how they interpret language in a movie. There are many courses where you can actually take up film appreciation and music related courses. These are all apart from what your regular courses, engineering or medicine or math. You are taking, you, you have a regular class, a regular college, but at the same time, you also want to learn something about films. For that, you cannot leave this and go and join another course, right? So you can take this course and simultaneously sign up for a, an online course that does focus on film appreciation or music. That is again some, an option that you can go for. Now, this we already talked about, you know, this once the videos are there, you know, nobody is pressuring you to sit and finish it in one shot and then submit the assignments immediately, nothing like that. It is there, you can watch it at any time. At night, after, before you go to bed, 15 minutes, I want to sit and watch, you can watch. And the, again, you know, these are all many, there are many courses that are pretty much not offered in your regular school colleges. Like I said, film appreciation. This is something not many colleges <coughs> offer. So you can take up this course while you are studying economics or math or commerce. You can still get a certificate in appreciating films. You can write about it. You can become a journalist. There are so many different courses. Once, once you go, once you start looking up courses, you know, you will understand what a wide variety of courses that are available. So you can go and check out those courses and then, you know, pick something that you like and at least try it out. If you can't finish it, that's fine. You can try it again because if they keep coming. Lots of courses are there. Right? And one important thing is, in most online courses, the course material, material meaning the videos, the assignments, everything is free. Any course, any university you go and join, most of the time you have to pay some fees for the books, for the course, for the teaching, for the tuition, whatever. Online courses, most of them are free, which is a very big advantage, right? You can go download the videos and learn on your own, right? And at the end, most of these uh, courses, they will offer you a certificate. You may, you may have to pay a small fees and then write an exam, get the certificate, but then, you know, this certificate, you know, it's from premier institutes like IIT. So you, it might, you know, you'll never know. It's once you go for an interview after you finish your course and you have a certificate in different, you know, variety of courses outside your regular curriculum, this is going to help you. Now, some of the, you are already aware of some of the sites that we mentioned, like, for example, edX. Are you familiar with the site? EDX, 
Yeah, I see two, three hands. Khan Academy, yeah, I heard many people mention that name. Then there is another one called Coursera. I'll show the Coursera one. Okay. The Coursera one, I'll go into the site and I'll show you. Okay. Udacity. These are all sites that you can go look up and look for different courses and see if something interests you. Okay, okay this is the Coursera site. As you can see on the left side, can you see from there? The courses are li listed on the left side. Yeah, these are the categories given here. I think it's not too visible from there. So they have arts, biology, com chemistry, computer science. Then in computer science, they have some profit branches: food and nutrition, engineering, education, humanities, medicine, maths, <coughs> music, physical health sciences, physics, social sciences, teacher developmental programs, and they have it in various languages too. So that is on the left side that you see, and. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. tick the categories, I guess. Yeah. So we have actually ticked the category called music, film and audio because we thought there is something you might be, you know, interested in seeing what is there. So that is the category, uh, the courses that you are seeing on the right side. Again, I don't know how much you can read from there. Yeah, once you select the music, film and audio tab, it is showing a list of universities that are offering courses on that particular topic, music, film, audio. On the right side under courses you will see the first one is University of California, the second one is University of London, University of North Carolina, University of Edinburgh. These are all different countries, courses from different countries. You can imagine if you want to take up a course, you are taking actually courses from these prominent universities all over the world. You can see the kind of courses, right? It says fundamentals of music theory, there is history of rock music. There is a part 1, that means a part 2, 3 probably is coming. Then you have ex exploring Beethoven's piano sonatas. I mean, firstly, listening to Beethoven is one thing. On top of that, somebody is going to discuss his whole music and you know, somebody is so interested. Imagine, Madras, where would you go and actually find some people who know Beethoven's music, discuss with them, have them offer a course on Beethoven or something like that. I don't think we are going to get this kind of an opportunity, you know, locally available. If you go to the musicology, we do have Carnatic music, we have a bit of Hindustani music. But I don't think we have in depth about you know this kind of western music or something. So this is something that you can uh, you know look at uh, various things. Probably something else if we click also we'll get. It, yeah. right? See the very first one, University of California. It says learning how to learn, powerful mental tools to help you master tough subjects. And the second one is saying enhance your career and employability skills. These are all as you go, you are going to need. Once you finish college, you know, you are going to start looking for a job and these are all skills that you are going to need at that time. So this is something you should look up and once in a while go see what they are offering and what kind of courses they are offering. And see there is one um, under all categories you can see teacher professional development. So this is meant for teachers, teaching professionals who can go and take up some classes where which, which might help them teach others. Okay, well. So then we have mathematics. So the beauty of this is right. I mean, you guys are doing any uh, programming languages in 11, 12 computer science students? C++. C++. Mm. No C, yeah. Directly or C++. Nine or C. Eleventh or C. Twelfth or doing C++. Okay, so if you actually go to this course or I don't know which one, one of them actually has a course in uh, learning C by the person who invented it or invented it rather in the way the C language formulated and so on, who, who was supposed to be say the father of C, he would be offering a course on C language here. So if you are learning C there in school, it makes sense to at least go and check out how they are teaching C. On NPTEL we have a course in introduction to programming in C which is getting offered right now. So that is a college view of, it's the same programming language, it's not going to be like it's something else or whatever, but it's like how you can get an exposure to how different people would teach the same thing. You can see how the same concepts are handled differently. For instance, you know, when I'm talking or when a teacher teaches me something, some things I understand, some things I don't. When some other person tells me in a different way the same concept, I understand it better. When I go to a third person, I understand some other concepts better. So it is like, I also don't pick up all 10 concepts from the same person. And the same, uh, you know, 10 children will not pick it up all from one person. You require different kinds of projecting the same matter in different ways, 
different ways that you explain, different examples that you give and so on. So if you are learning something, right, at present even if you are not going say in for certification, if you are not going in for something, whatever is relevant to your topics, right, there will be some courses which are there, you can enhance your content, you can enhance your knowledge, learn, you know, understand it better rather than just going with your school knowledge or whatever is there. So, come yeah. So, something similar in India, the IIT is offering, it's called NPTEL, as you can see there, you can write down that URL, nptel.ac.in, I suggest that all of you go and look it, check up, okay. Now, NPTEL is also offering online courses, I don't know how many of you are aware, as you can see at the top, that green bar says join NPTEL online courses. So, if you go and click there, it will take you to a page where all the course names will be listed. You can go and click and some of them are meant for 11th and 12th standard too. So, please go look it up. See, this was started, the NPTEL was started by the IITs and it, any content that you see in NPTEL, videos, MP3s, PDF files, they are all free. You can download anytime, it is free. And this includes, you know, MP3, you can listen to, you know, lectures and understand. Like I said, you can click on the join NPTEL online certification course and sign up and then you can access videos. Now, as you can see at the center, it says start July 1st. July 1st, another session has started where we are offering many online courses. See, NPTEL online course again, the material is free. You can, like just like any other online course, there is a discussion forum. You can go and interact with the teachers, with your peers, with your peers and then there are so many different courses. See the core subjects, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, these are some of the disciplines or subjects that you can you can see in NPTEL. Some of them as you can see there are physics, chemistry, mathematics, computer science. So go to NPTEL site, sign, site and at the bottom of the screen you will see this listed. You can go click on that and download videos and see if that helps you, C++ and C and all that. Okay, these uh, NPTEL we do core engineering, okay. We had just two courses targeted at standard 11 and uh, 12 I guess which we ran during the summer which was invitation to mathematics and uh, uh, heat wave oscillations uh, course by a uh, physics prof here. So those two may be the only ones which are relevant to you at this point of time or we have a C course and we have a programming data structures course if you are interested in that. But NPTEL will be more useful if you guys get into higher education, you get into college, you are getting into engineering, you are getting into some science stream or whatever then this will be more relevant. I guess that time you won't be coming to a studio, you may come in for a different reason to you know get some courses from us or whatever but this is more like two years down the line, a year down the line that we are looking at that you will be accessing and help you know tell other students that these are there. The same thing which Professor Anand was saying, air pollution in Chennai and air pollution in Los Angeles right. So NPTEL courses will be more like what we are talking about the Chennai scenario. So these all are Indian profs you know, giving courses, uh, giving examples from our own uh, country. If they are talking about civil engineering, it will be examples quoted from India rather than something happening in Minnesota, say, you know, which I wouldn't know the city planning or the urban planning or something. So, when Indian profs talk about it, it's more relevant to us in that sense. Probably the accent is more understandable to a lot of us. You know, when the foreign profs talk, there is a little bit of an accent confusion when if you are not too used to their kind of speaking. So, when the Indian profs talk, I guess that is another thing which works in our favour. So we have about 8 cent by courses in this across so many disciplines. So currently what you, uh, I mean, don't go to NPTEL today and say, oh my god, you know, I don't get anything here and nothing works for me here. So what we are talking about today is more like one year, two years down the line when you get into college or maybe even when you get into PG or something, it's a resource you can come back to. Okay, it's just general information, online courses, there are two types. Okay, you can look it up. These are all different. See. As you can see the variety, some are in physics, some you, as you can see in the middle you will see better spoken English. We all want to speak better in English, right? As you go, you know, further in your, career, in your studies and your career, you want to be able to speak better in English. There is a course called better spoken English. You can go watch those videos. Anybody can watch those videos, right? Yeah. And then you have uh, modern construction materials, you have film appreciation, programming in C, philosophy. It's not just sciences. Huh? I think so, yeah. So this, these two courses, recently we, we just had one exam on this, right. These two courses, we just finished online courses. These are meant for actually uh, students who are in 11th and 12th. The physics portions are from your portion, uh, curriculum. Mechanics, heat, oscillations, waves. Do you guys study that now? Some of you nodding, yes. 
and then again high school curriculum invitation to math and these were two subjects that was covered in this recently and like I said July 1st another round of courses have started where we have two courses that you might be interested in one is called practical English where again it's about basics of English how you can learn English how you can teach English and the other one is introduction to program in C which some of you have already learned so if you want to go check it out you might it might be a revision for you just go and explore go to all these sites and see what is there now the NPTEL site the other uh, advantage we would see of online courses is something that you know we have seen I mean from last year we've been running these courses March 2014 we started so we've done about uh, 60 courses so far 24 are now going on I, I think one advantage is see if you are looking at say Vanwani school right every day I go to the same class through the years my batchmates have been the same my classmates have been the same the competing level that I am doing is against the students in my class, right? I am pegging myself against them. Sometimes I may go to an Olympiad or I might go to some exam where I am probably pegging myself against the students in other schools or something like that. But basically my geography is limited to my classroom, my school and that's where a large part of me I spend my time. So in these online courses one beauty is that you have students from all over the world there. Like we have, uh, I mean 98% uh, is from India, about 2% we have the world over uh, thing. But we have participation in courses right from say 5,000 students in a course to 50,000 students in a course. Okay, so you have people from the US, you have people from Japan, you have Southeast Asia, you have students from uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan and across India. So across right from Kanyakumari to Jammu Kashmir we are running exams and we have students from all over participating. So when you are in such a course, and you are doing assignments, you are discussing and all that. You are actually interacting with people across the globe, you know. So that is some exposure that you will not get when you are say sitting in a class and doing regular work or whatever. So that is something that is possible in such a forum. When you have an online course, again sitting in the comfort of your home, you are going to be doing it, right. So that is something that you can think of, you know. And uh, yeah, we have some profs also from the US doing courses for NPTEL now. So we have a prof uh, from Rice University who is coming here from an Australian university who is coming here. So they are also getting into the NPTEL forum and they are making courses for us. So that's again another exposure that you get to foreign professors teaching you certain concepts. So that is something that uh, we would like to say. So this is the NPTEL website that we have. If you go to nptel.ac.in, this is the website that you will see. And uh, under uh, portal, can we portal? Online courses. Mm. Yes, come on. So this is the portal like the Courser index that we run. This is a Google uh, portal. Google is supporting us in this uh, portal. I mean it's a platform. The platform on which you know I require something to put my videos on. I require something where I can have an assignments. We are not doing the entire programming capability of building all these structures. For instance, a school requires classrooms, a blackboard, all your infrastructure and so on, right? I mean every year we are not going to keep doing it. Somebody provides it for us, you just come and go into that. So Google does it for us, we give the content there and you are going to come in and study there and go. So this is what we call as a portal. On this portal we have all these courses currently. So what we were talking about, the relevant ones would be the third row that you can see, introduction to programming in C. That is something yes, that you can actually explore. And uh, there is a practical English one here. Yeah, there is a practical row. English that you can probably see currently. In your standard 11 and 12, currently what you can see and what might, you know, uh, reach out to you would be these kind of courses. Otherwise, we had a film appreciation course. You can probably go through that if you are interested. That course is actually over but the videos will be on our website. So that was an interesting course where she was discussing about the various uh, films through the eras, English films and how they classify films and you know, what are the kinds of uh, films that we see, uh, history in films. Then uh, it was language in films, a lot of things that she was discussing on a prof from IIT who did that course for us. So we had that and uh, Carnatic music. Appreciating Carnatic music. We have a course now going on. So that is uh, still ongoing and she teaches about the basics of Carnatic music and it's not about uh, teaching you to sing. It's about teaching you to appreciate Carnatic music. What are the nuances in that and what is the basic things, what are the, how is it divided, what are the parts of it and so on. So this is something that uh, I think 
is unique to NPTEL because in the Coursera edX, if you go, they have a lot of Western music, but I guess they still don't have a Carnatic music course. So this is something that you can check out if you're interested in Carnatic music. But otherwise, most of our, this one is all engineering related. Engineering or sciences related, that is what you would find. But if you go to Coursera, edX or your Khan Academy also, Khan Academy again, I guess is academics related. But Coursera and edX, they have a lot of courses which are very generic. For instance, you want to become a writer. They have certain courses which are for creative writing. How do you, you know, uh, what are the various uh, things for writing? Or what are the professions available? If you say, I want to become a writer, it's so generic, right? But there are so many types of writing. Like you have, say, in a company you go to, you can just do the product writing. It's called technical writing, technical English. You have to learn certain things for that. Then you have your journal writing and probably so many more. So they actually classify, they give you what are, what is the skills to be acquired if you want to become this, if you want to become that, if you want to become something else or whatever. For instance, it's uh, interesting, you know. Uh, I mean, for at least for me, writing was all the same. Okay, I write, yeah, you know, you're a writer kind. But when you do something like a personality thing, to become a journalist, there's also personality traits. If I write well, it's not enough. You need to be outspoken to go, I just come, I talk to you, I'm able to interview you. Then I become a journalist, right? But if I'm an author of a book, I don't typically have to do that. I can sit at home, I can formulate my ideas and I can get into writing. So there are also personality traits that are required. So in that course, there's a nice course on Coursera where he talks about, you know, if you want to get into this, what are the other traits also you require? You may be a good writer, your English may be really good, the words that you use may be fabulous, but you know, what are the other things that you require to kind of get into it? That is also something that's spoken about. So this is one example I'm giving you about writing, but he talks about so many things, I mean the various courses if you go through, there's so many things that they talk to you, it could just give you a perspective on what's available, you know, what are the streams that you could get into, and you know, apart from engineering, apart from sciences, what else can you do in uh, life, what else could be your interest or something. So what do you guys want to do after 12th? Who is in 12th here, only that group there, right? What do you want to do? Say apart from engineering. Sorry? I didn't get it. That's what, what do you want to do apart from engineering? Apart from the engineers, uh, aspiring engineers here. Aspiring doctors, okay, let's leave them also. <laughs> Anything else that you know you really want to explore? Yeah. Okay, music. Okay. Yes. Marine biology. Marine biology. Okay. Yes. I want to review films. You want to review films. Okay. Good. That's it. All the others are engineers. Engineers. <laughs> doctors. Okay. Right. So just go through that to get a perspective of you know. Uh, what is available? That's what we are saying. Broaden your view and uh, get to there. Yeah, um, yeah, that is over. So I think, yeah, this is, I mean, this is the overview you wanted to give. So hope you have the URLs with you, right? We have Coursera, you have edX, you have your Khan Academy, you have your NTA.ac.in. <coughs> IIT Bombay, if you go, there is something called spoken tutorials that they do, which is all just the audio format. They don't do a video format of it. There are quite a few courses in that too. For instance, the technical courses, some of it here, they just have the MP3 formats of that. So you can download it and just listen to it. You don't need a video player to see that. So that's also there from IIT Bombay that uh, you can see. So we encourage you to try all this. And then I think we have a small... Uh, yeah. Course. Yeah, we just wanted to see how much you know. Could be trivial, but yeah, some things that you could learn today. Okay, so this is a quiz. If you know the answer, please raise your hands, okay? No shouting and, okay? It's basically trivia, okay? Just, just a small quiz, that's all. So this is the logo of which? Okay, let's see if you know the next one. What does URL stand for? You are, you have the options, you may read, th read that and tell me. You know, tell me A, B, C, D, which one? So it's uniform resource locator. Yes. So you knew that? Or you le did you learn it in school? Yes. Everybody knows? Okay, great. Okay. What is the URL of Parvani School? What is the URL of Parvani School? Parvani? Parvani at IIT. 
Okay. Okay, so everybody knows it's Steve Jobs, Steve right? Jobs. Okay. How many of you have seen that TV movie on Steve Jobs? What's the name of the movie? Jobs. Jobs. There was one other movie. Hands. Java was originally invented by <laughs> Sun. You guys already know it's this question. It's not Microsoft, it is Sun. The answer is D. Okay, what did Sergey Brin and Larry Page create? Yes. Google. Google, yes. Google is there. Is the <laughs> We all know that. <laughs> How many of you go and buy things on Flipkart? Oh. What kind of things? Shoes, books. Okay, next one. India's first supercomputer. Let's me let me see some hands. Who knows? Anybody? No, the answer is C. It's called Param. Do you see the picture there? That is how it will look. A room full of computers sitting together. <laughs> We actually have a supercomputer in a computer center in IIT. Okay. Maybe if you are interested, you can tell ma'am to get permission and you can actually go and see the computer center. I mean, it will look like just boxes again, but we do have a, at least I think four or five we have. We have those cray one, cray two and all that stuff. We have the supercomputers here. Okay, so the internet was originally developed by? U.S. Department of Justice. It was just an internal thing for the Justice Department. And then it developed into what you see now. So, so the Google, it derives its name from the word Google. What does that mean? D? Option, option in the What is that? Dub, dub, dub. <laughs> Look at the options. <laughs> what could it be? Come on, take a guess. W, W, W. Dub, dub, dub. Did you know that? Why is it that we we are uh, um, people suggest that don't write in capital letters and bold and all that? Why is that? Why? What did you say? It is equivalent to shouting. When you write in all caps, you know we like to put so much different color fonts and different you know uh, colors and bold and big letters and all that. If you do the entire email in that, it's equivalent to you actually shouting at that person. So when you compose emails, you should be very careful. The language and even the font and the size matters. Okay, this is an e-commerce com company founded in 2007 by Indians, two Indians. eBay. Which one? eBay. Which one? eBay. Not eBay. Amazon. Not Jabong. It's Flipkart. So, all of you thought it's from somebody outside India, right? No, it's by two Indian. So, this you must know. You must have learned in school. How is the speed of your internet connection measured? C. C. Now, which is not a search engine? C. eBay. Ask Jeeves also, you can go and your, it's for, to help you, yeah. Okay, now pay attention. This tagline is associated with which organization? Powered by intellect, driven by values. Which one? Are you sure? It is Infosys. It's Infosys. Okay, this one. Where do you want to go today? 
not Wipro. Microsoft. What does HTML stand for? Which one is it? It is B, Universal Serial Bus. What is LAN? OS. What does NPTEL stand for? So now, now when you hear the word NPTEL, you know, right? Thank you so much.